Chaque semaine, l'Extra Interview recueille les confessions de personnalités amoureuses du petit et du grand écran. Aujourd'hui, nous recevons Jonathan Co, auteur british brillant et caustique, habité par le cinéma au point d'en distiller des hommages dans chacun de ses ouvrages. Dans Expo 58, il y a deux ans, il nommait ses personnages principaux, Wayne et Radford, comme les acteurs qui incarnent le duo Charters et Caldicott dans The Lady Vanishes de Hitchcock. Dans son dernier roman, l'excellent numéro 11, il intègre à sa galerie de personnages un homme obsédé par le cinéma au point de consacrer sa vie à un film perdu. Et c'est par la télévision que tout a commencé. When you were younger, it was television that you were watching, that you yeah. were learning through. Yeah, the 1970s were a really good time for British TV. Uh, in a way that people from other European countries sometimes find it hard to understand, because really our, our best writers and directors were working on television. So Ken Loach's early work, Stephen Freer's early work, Mike Lee's early work, it was all on uh, BBC TV and we didn't have to pay anything for it, it just came into our homes every night. It was an incredible time. And also a very good comedy series, not just funny, but also uh, serious and reflective of Uh, you know, you could learn what the country was like through watching these shows. A lot of my writing skills come from watching that stuff, particularly the way I approach writing dialogue. Was it just by listening to it, or did you study them? Well, there was a strange uh, phenomenon in the, uh, in the 1970s, which was the novelization. Uh, because obviously no uh, video recorders, so once a program was broadcast, it was gone until it was repeated again but uh, they turned them into books. And I had a, a Likely Lads novel. And, you know, I read this book. I still have the copy. It's falling apart because I read it so many times. So, uh, you know, a lot of what I remember of the show came from that. But also, uh, I used to record the audio off, television, off the television. Not with comedy shows so much, but with, uh, with movies. With Billy Wilder's movies particularly, which uh, I discovered kind of in the mid-70s and became very obsessed with, fell, fell in love with completely. And, uh, yeah, I used to buy audio cassettes, C-120s they were called, because they were two hours long, and you could fit the entire dialogue track of a film onto this, and I would listen to it in bed at night, the way that other people read books before going to sleep. Not since Scarface, so much action. Not since the Marx Brothers, so much comedy. Not since the seven-year itch, so much Maryland. I, I think he was the great master of, of narrative architecture in the cinema, planting clues and uh, images and lines of dialogue early in a film which don't seem to mean very much, and then they would come back and they would pay off later on. I always also loved the way that reaching a mass audience was very important to him, and yet uh, he wouldn't compromise on the intelligence of his films. So he always negotiated a very careful path between those two things. I remember uh, something that a, a screenwriting collaborator of his said to Billy Wilder. He said that the, the, he thought the screenplay they were working on wasn't subtle enough. He said, what about the subtleties? And Billy Wilder said, sure, we can have subtleties, but let's make the subtleties obvious. And uh, that's kind of my motto as a writer, that, you know, the, the sophistication has to be there, but everybody has to be able to understand it. The best picture this year will also be the funniest. Good night, sugar. Good night, honey. If you've been so much... Um drowned into television when you were young. Did you remain faithful to it? I, I read you were obsessed with Downton Abbey. <laughs> Maybe uh, it's a strong not, word. It's a strong word, yeah. Uh, I'm fascinated by Downton Abbey, which is not quite, not quite the same thing. And I'm fascinated by how, why it was made now, or, you know, in the last few years, at a time of uh, great economic hardship and austerity in the UK. Why do people retreat into this kind of nostalgic fantasy of uh, an England that has long disappeared? And uh, why is it so popular around the world? Why is it this particular version of Englishness that we're so good at celebrating and exporting? And, uh, you know, to, to, to me, it's, a, it's an absolute fantasy, a kind of conservative right-wing fantasy, which is so well-made and so enjoyable 
that everybody watches it. But it's also kind of ridiculous. Well, you know, so much television nowadays uh, is about crime uh, and detection and murder and violence. And uh, that, I get a bit bored of that, but at the same time, I'm drawn into it like everybody else. So I like these particularly Scandinavian long-form series like, uh, like The Bridge and The Killing, which attempt to weave crime and politics together not always as successfully as you'd like, but beautifully made, fantastically acted. I think the woman who plays the detective in The Bridge, uh, I forget her name, is, uh, is an amazing actress. Echo start as it crosses the room Trembling noises that come too soon Spatial moon which seems to me you said that whenever you were listening to a song, with a, well, for listening to a mix of music and words, music was what uh, striked you first, was yeah. what you were concentrating on first. How is it with movies when you add images to this um, fusion? Yeah, I, I have a... I, I understand the world, world, first of all, through my ears, I think, not through my eyes. So, uh, of course, film is primarily a visual medium and the, the greatest films are full of uh, in incredibly strong, memorable visual images. But even then, I listen to the dialogue more than I watch what's happening on the screen, I think. So a lot of the, my favorite filmmakers would be people who uh, really, their strength is in dialogue rather, rather than through images. Billy Wilder is one example, Woody Allen is another. I mean, I love Woody Allen, but I don't remember much of what his films look like. I just remember the lines, the dialogue. Qu'un écrivain se concentre sur les mots, rien de très surprenant au final. Et c'est sur les siens que nous vous invitons à vous pencher avec le très beau numéro 11. 